Great. Welcome. We are so happy to have you join us for the Toomey and Associates Parent Workshop. We hope that you find this information very valuable and helpful for you and your child to make eating go better in your home. I am Dr. Kay Toomey. I am a pediatric psychologist by training. I also happen to be the parent of a child who had a feeding problem. And so I had my daughter when she was uh, 35 weeks gestation. So she was born prematurely. In addition to that, she had very extreme gastroesophageal reflux. And as a result of that, uh, the first seven months of our life were down in the trenches. I happened to be in the field for 10 years when I had my daughter. I theoretically knew what I was doing when I had my child with a feeding issue. And I can tell you that it made me absolutely neurotic to have a child who didn't eat. It is very challenging to be the parent of a child who doesn't eat, even if you think you know what's going on. Um, and, and I like to tell the professionals that I train and the families I work with, when you're the parent of a child who doesn't eat, you are going to be neurotic. Um, you just need to give up the fight, be neurotic for a while, okay? You're wasting a lot of energy fighting being neurotic. Just go with the flow uh, because you really can't help it. It, it, it is something that is so worrisome to us um, as parents when our kids don't eat. And, and the good news that I can tell you is it does get better. Um, my daughter also um, has a little bit of low normal muscle tone. She's very auditorily hypersensitive. She has hyperextensible joints. That's her father's fault. Um, the auditory hypersensitivity is me. It does get better when you have a child who doesn't eat. Um, she actually is a phenomenal uh, eater at this point in time. Obviously, she's been doing this program since pretty much the day she was born. And so hopefully you all uh, have a set of handouts that you printed out the PowerPoint slides. You're going to see as the um, last thing in your handouts, on the very last page of your handouts, you should have um, what we call a food list or a food range uh, list. And what I'd like you to do is, as we're talking here, if you can, go ahead and fill out this food uh, range diary for me. What I'm looking for you to do is to give me a list of all the proteins, starches, fruits or vegetables that your child eats on a regular basis. And so I'm not looking for them to eat a lot of those foods. So if your child will consistently about 80% of the time take one to three bites of this food, that's all they have to take, it can go on this list. Okay, so it, I'm not looking for volume here, I'm looking for variety of foods. And as you know, living with a child who is young and or has a feeding challenge, uh, they don't eat the same exact thing necessarily every single time you give it to them. And that's why we say as long as they take one to three bites, 80% of the time it can go on this list. Now some things to think about with this list is we need to start changing the way we as grown-ups think about food. Um, and so I don't want you to write on this list beef. If you write beef on this list, I have no clue as a feeding therapist what you are talking about, really. Are you talking about a hamburger? Are you talking about beef brisket? Are you talking about a steak? Are you talking about French dip? Are you talking about just a roast beef lunch meat? You need to be very specific to me because uh, every one of those different variations of beef is a different food to your child because children classify foods based on how much oral motor work, how much mouth work it takes to get that food down, and what are the sensory properties of this food. So to a child, a saltine cracker is actually a different food than a town cracker. A saltine cracker is square, it's white, it shatters in your mouth, it's very salty. A town cracker is oval, it is kind of yellowish orangish, it's very buttery, and it melts in your mouth. That is a completely different food, uh, those two foods. Now, a, a goldfish 
cracker and an Annie's bunny, eh, they're pretty much the same food, okay? They're kind of the same size, shape, color, texture, taste, work the same in your mouth. Um, so so uh, I, I want you to think about, though, the different things. A chicken nugget is a completely different food than chicken lunch meat. A chicken nugget is a small, round, brown, breaded, pre-chewed piece of meat that's warm. That's what a chicken nugget is. And that's why children gravitate to what we call pre-chewed meat. So what are pre-chewed meats? Chicken nuggets, fish sticks, hot dogs, bologna. <laughs> Those are your pre-chewed meats. And the reason why our kids gravitate to them is because the manufacturer chews them up in the plant, forms them into whatever shape they want, better yet, throws some breading on top of it, and now I don't have to do much work to get that food down. Um, so, so a chicken lunch meat is flat, it's whitish pinkish, it's wet, it's cold, it's kind of wiggly. It is a really different kind of food. A freeze-dried strawberry is a different food than a fresh strawberry, is a different food than strawberry jam, which is a different food than strawberry jello and strawberry jelly and is a different food um, than a dried strawberry. So I want you to be really specific here. Uh, and uh, you know, if your child does yogurt, give me some idea of flavors and different kinds because a coconut yogurt is actually pretty different than a Greek yogurt. Um, and, and so I want you to be super, super specific of what you're going to put on this list. And, and I do give kids, you know, kind of one credit for apple juice, white grape juice. They're pretty much alike. Uh, you get a separate credit for milk. But if you're eating something like Green Machine or drinking something like Green Machine, I'll give you some credit for that as well. So put down your pizza, your macaroni and cheese. Everybody's like, where do those go? They go in both the protein and starch column because you get half a credit for the cheese in your macaroni and cheese, and you get half a credit for your pasta. You get half a credit for grilled cheese for the cheese and half for the bread, half a credit for the bread and pizza, half a credit for the cheese. Um, if they do another top it, we'll top it, Topping, uh, sorry, like a pepperoni, we'll give you another credit. You don't get credit for the tomato sauce. <laughs> so now, if you do spaghetti sauce, tomato sauce, ketchup, eh, I might give you half a credit. <laughs> so, so be as thorough with that list as you can for me. And we're going to come back to this as we go along. So we're going to be talking about when children don't eat, when children won't eat, and how do we help them eat better. So you are going to have first some statements of financial and non-financial disclosures and relationships. Um, you do need to know that I am a consultant for Gerber Baby Food Products. And the baby cereal puffs that Gerber has is one of the products that I help them create. Um, and we created that food specifically because at the time that I, was look that I started working with them, Cheerios was the primary first finger food that parents in the USA were feeding their children at nine months of age. And Cheerios are actually not a developmentally appropriate first finger food. And so I asked Gerber to make me a developmentally appropriate first finger food. And, and so um, I, I do do consultation with them. I also belong to a um, uh, parent online support group called Feeding Matters. Um, and and um, it is an unpaid position on their professional council. They are a phenomenal resource for you. And it's simply www.feedingmatters.org. And um, they were started by four moms in Arizona. And they um, have been around about 15 years. They have a huge organization. And every two years, they get the world's leading feeding experts together. And we have a big conference uh, with you all as families. And, and it's about half professionals, about half families. 
And in January of this year, we had about 250 parents and about 250 professionals at that conference, either live in audience or live streamed. So you can actually join the conference live stream. There are tons and tons of resources on that website, and I would encourage you to go to the Feeding Matters um, website. If you need some support, they will call you, and they will talk to you, and they will help you through this process. So we're going to start by talking about why kids don't eat. Uh, what, what's going on here? Um, we're going to talk some about the normal developmental skills your child needs to get on board in order to be able to eat a typical table food diet. Of a, with a wide variety of textures and nutrition. And then we're going to talk about some strategies of things that you can do in your home to make feeding go better. So the first thing that we're going to talk about is this idea that when a child doesn't eat well, that child is not eating well because something about their body is not working correctly. And many, many people think that when children don't eat, it's all in their heads. Ugh, all kids are picky, they all outgrow it. It's just all in their head. None of those statements are true. None of those statements are true. When children don't eat, it's because something about their body isn't following the normal developmental path. And that, of course, can range from an issue that's very mild to an issue that is quite severe. But children who have feeding difficulties, it is all in their body. It is not all in their head. And so that's where I want us to think about and start. Because when children don't eat, the feeding problem is what we see as parents. The feeding problem is literally the tip of the iceberg. It is what's underneath the water that crashes our ship. And, and we do our feeding therapy using a program called the SOS approach to feeding. Now, professionally, it stands for sequential oral sensory. But as you know, SOS stands for save our ship. Because <laughs> when we're the parents of a child who doesn't eat well, we feel like we're crashing into this iceberg all the time. We feel like we're drowning. Uh, and so that name serves two purposes. The issue is that feeding is the most complicated thing you will ever do in your entire lifetime as a human organism. It is literally the most difficult thing you will ever do in your entire lifetime. And we all think it's easy because we all have been doing it since we were babies. Now, those of you who have kids that have feeding challenges, you know it's not as easy as what everybody makes it out to be, right? Because you live this every day. But the reason why feeding is the most challenging thing you will ever do in your lifetime is because of the fact that eating, feeding is the only thing you do as a human organism that requires involvement of all seven areas of human function. You have to have every one of those seven areas working correctly, and you have to be able to integrate within every one of those seven areas across every one of those seven areas. And this is oftentimes why your kid looks pretty good at other self-help skills. They look pretty good at play. They look pretty good at school. But when it comes to eating, it falls apart because it literally is the most complicated thing we do. So we're going to hopefully, there we go, talk very, very briefly about what those seven areas are, and then we're going to go into a little bit more detail. Um, so the first of the seven areas we need to think about is organ system functioning. Eating is literally the only thing you do as a human that involves every single solitary one of your organ systems. This is it. Eating's it. Heart, lungs, skeleton, nervous system, gastrointestinal tract. Eating's the only thing you use your liver for. It's the only thing you use your gallbladder for. It takes all of your brain power to be able to eat. Eating is it. It is the only thing. And it involves all of your endocrine and hormone systems as well. Hormones are involved in the process of eating. Eating is the only thing we do that involves every single solitary muscle in our bodies. Because in order to sit upright and have good posture to eat, we have to use our feet, our legs, our trunk, our arms, our head, our neck. And not only do we have to use what we would think about as our exterior muscles, we also, in eating, 
have to use our interior muscles. And eating is the only thing where you use every one of your interior muscles. Eating is the only thing that you use your digestive tract for. And your digestive tract is a muscle. And if your child has low muscle tone, even if your child has low normal muscle tone, they may have challenges with their tongue. The tongue is the start of the digestive tract with how the food moves down the esophagus, how the food moves through the various valves. There's a valve at the top of your stomach that has to open to let the food in and then close to make sure you don't reflux it out. There's a valve at the bottom of the stomach that has to stay closed until you've digested your food enough and then it has to open to let the food go into the intestines. Your intestines then have to squish and squeeze all the food through the system so you can absorb your nutrition. And then it has to take and squeeze all the waste out. So one of the things you see with children who have tone issues is they have problems with constipation because they don't have the tone to get the poo out the end of the system. And if the back end of the system is backed up, they have constipation, you will back up the front end. Constipation can create cramping in the stomach. Constipation create, can create a lack of appetite. And it actually can create vomiting as well. And it's all because it's a muscle system that if you have low tone is going to have low tone in it, just like the rest of your body. Eating is the only thing we do that involves all eight of our sensory systems. And we have eight systems, not five, like you learn in school. Um, there are actually eight systems. And there are only two human behaviors in which you have to simultaneously integrate eight new pieces of information across every one of those eight systems. And, and eating is one of the two. And we'll talk about later uh, what the other one is. But eating is one of the two. Your nutritional status absolutely impacts whether you eat, whether you continue to eat. If you are not taking in enough calories, you are going to be weak, you are not going to have any energy to eat, and you may fatigue early. But it's not just about how much volume you eat. It is the quality of the volume you eat. Because if you are not taking sufficient iron, insufficient iron directly impacts your fatigue level and you will fatigue more rapidly. If you are not taking adequate zinc, you will not have an appetite. Zinc deficiency is a well-known uh, micronutrient deficit that causes appetite suppression. If you don't have sufficient vitamin D in your system, you are not going to absorb your calories correctly. In young children, vitamin D deficiency can cause underweight. In older children and us as grown-ups, vitamin D deficiency causes us to gain too much weight. Um, and so it is an issue in obesity. So your micronutrients, the vitamins and minerals that you eat, play a direct role in your ability to continue to eat and how you continue to eat. Learning plays a role. Your learning style, your learning capacity, your learning history. And what we know about eating is that eating after six months of age is actually a learned behavior. And we're going to talk more about that. When people say, oh, it's automatic, it's instinctive, it happens no matter what, yeah, none of that's true either. Um, eating is driven by your appetite instinct only for the first four to six weeks of your life. That's it. First four to six weeks. So you can't use appetite as an excuse anymore for overeating. <laughs> so what you have to look at is around four to six weeks of age, there is a shift in your appetite drive, in your appetitive drive, and your primitive motor reflexes that you should be born with take over as the primary driver of eating. The issue is that those reflexes essentially go away between four and six months of age. So that after six months of age, eating is a voluntary motor movement and your child has to learn to eat. After six months of age, your child only has three choices. They either learn to eat, they learn to not eat, or they learn to kind of sort of eat. That's it. Those are the three choices. So you have to figure out which of those categories your child has fallen into. 
People who are visual learners tend to be picky eaters because they look at a food and decide they don't like the way it looks and they're not even going to try it. So your learning capacity, what is your cognitive age? We know the older, more mature you are from an intellectual standpoint, um, up to a point, the easier it is for you to learn how to eat. But there are certain cognitive ages that actually make it more difficult to learn to eat. And a lot of people think you should wait until the kids are older and you can reason with them to get them in therapy. The exact opposite is true. The most difficult children to treat from a feeding standpoint are children from 6 to 11 years of age. They are going to be your most difficult age group of kids. So don't wait, don't wait, don't wait. The history absolutely plays a role in whether your child learns to eat or not, not eat. If every time your child ate, they had reflux and they vomited, they will learn that eating makes me vomit and they will stop eating as a result of that learning. So history does play a role, learning plays an active role. And again, we'll talk a little bit more about each of these as we go. Development also plays a role. We know that we have developmental drives, that we are supposed to follow a normal developmental path, that we are hardwired to do that as human beings. We know there are certain times in development where for all children, all children, eating gets better and gets worse. For a child who is typically developing, whose body is working really well, they will get through those transition time periods with not much more than a couple of hiccups. If you are not following the normal developmental trajectory pathway, when you hit those normal developmental transitions in feeding, you will crash and you may not pick up as well as you should. And then the next transition comes along and you crash a little more. And then you crash a little more. And there's five major transitions that occur. And then, of course, the environment does play a role in eating. What I'm going to tell you is that as parents, we do not cause our children's feeding difficulties. What the data shows is parents are the cause of children's feeding difficulties in only 5 to 8% of the cases. And one of the first things I tell my professional colleagues when I teach them how to do the SOS approach to feeding is that if you as a professional are blaming the parent for this child's feeding difficulty, you are going to be wrong 93 to 98% of the time. So don't go there, because you're probably wrong. That said, there are things we do as parents that make our kids eating better, and there are things we do that makes it worse. So that's what we have to help ourselves understand so that we're being helpful to our kids and not getting in the way. So let's spend a little more time talking about this. As we said, what happens when kids don't eat? When kids first start to have feeding difficulties, what you're going to hear for everybody, from everybody, is they're going to jump right to its development. Its development. All kids are picky. They all outgrow it. The data does not support that. What the data indicates is that Around 25%, and actually in the last two years, there have been some really big new studies from around the world that show that as many as 33% of children will struggle with some kind of feeding challenge in the first 11 years of life. So somewhere really between about 25 and 33% of kids are going to struggle with some kind of feeding challenge in the first decade of their life. Now, that's a pretty high number. But it's not all kids. <laughs> um, it's about a quarter to maybe a third of those kids. And what the data shows is only between a third and a half of those children will actually outgrow their picky eating without some kind of assistance from a professional who specializes in feeding. Only a third to 50% of those kids will actually just outgrow it. 
Um, and, and I have the privilege of speaking around the world. I actually was just in London teaching at the beginning of June um, for about two weeks. In March, I was in Beijing and Hong Kong. I was in Australia shortly before that. I was in Johannesburg and Helsinki uh, before that. And I can tell you that the feeding problems that children have and these feeding statistics hold around the world. They hold around the world. These statistics are the same no matter where you go. Children's feeding problems are the same no matter where you go in the world. And in fact, what we know is feeding problems have been the same literally for thousands of years. So if feeding problems have been the same type of feeding problems for thousands of years across the world, feeding problems can't be a problem of our day and age, can it? It can't be about how we parent in today's day and age. It can't be about our culture. There are certainly things that cultures do that make eating better and things cultures do that make it worse, just like us as parents. But, but it is an issue with how the human body is put together. It is all in the body. It is not all in the head. It is not all in the parent's fault. It is not about the culture. We know, as I said, there are five major developmental transitions that are going to happen where your child is going to struggle with eating. And, and so the bad news is you're not out of the woods until they hit early adolescence. Hopefully, if they're struggling below 12, you're getting some assistance, getting your child back onto the normal developmental path so that they aren't going to have more than a hiccup when they hit these later transitions. Um, and, and so we will go into more detail about each of these. But the first one is definitely four to six months. You could say the first one's actually between four to six weeks when the appetite instinct shifts. Um, the second one is definitely four to six months. The next is 12 to 14 months. Around the world, the most common age to get a gastrostomy tube placed, if you don't get it in the NICU, is six to seven months and 14 to 16 months. Because kids don't make it through these transitions, they crash and they end up with G-tubes as, as a result of the crash. Around a year and a half to two and a half, somewhere around five to seven, um, it could be five, six, it could be six, seven, and somewhere around nine to 11, nine, 10, 10 to 11. So we'll be talking about what those are. Along the way, there are some very specific skills we need to get on board in order to get through these transitions well and to eat well. The five major skill sets that we need are going to be the ability to handle the sensation of food and of eating. We have to be able to have sensory tolerance for what the food feels like, smells like, looks like, works like in our bodies, on our bodies, in our mouth. We have to have postural stability. In the body's list of priorities, eating is not your number one priority. Breathing is your number one priority. Eating is not your second priority either. Not falling on your head is your second priority. Protecting your brain is your second priority, and that's what postural stability is about. There is a specific oral motor skill called tongue tip lateralization. And children who avoid eating real meat, like a pork chop, a chicken breast, steak, brisket, all those harder to chew, real meats, a ham steak, the, if those children, if your child is avoiding real meat, hard raw fruits with peels, and hard raw vegetables, your child probably has this issue with tongue tip lateralization. So this list that you're making for me, I want you to be starting to look at what foods are missing off this list. Because what foods you put on this list are as important as the foods you don't put on this list. It is gonna give us a huge amount of information about what may be going on with your child. The other skill, oral motor wise, we need to get on board is rotary chewing, and we'll look at that as well. And then certainly, we would like and ideally 
could really use to have our kids come willingly to the table. Now, are they going to come willingly to the table every single solitary time it's time to eat? No. That is the nature of the beast <laughs> of being a child. Uh, so, But ideally, we'd like them to enjoy eating, to enjoy food, to enjoy the experience of sitting with us as a family. Because eating isn't just about the volume of what your child consumes. A big piece of eating is the social experience and the physical enjoyment of the task. It is not just about volume. It's about enjoyment. That's what eating is about. That's why we go out to eat as a restaurant, to have someone else do the dishes and so we can enjoy the food and the fact that somebody else cooked it in addition. Um, it is about enjoyment. All right. So when and why do kids become picky eaters? Children who have even very mild physical issues oftentimes are going to begin to fall apart or falter during one of those five major transition time uh, points and or they're not going to get the correct skills on board because they're missing the underlying foundational skills. And if you don't have the basic building blocks, you're just going to keep getting further and further behind is what you're going to see. And, and then, of course, once you get behind with your skills, you're going to get behind on your nutrition. Once you get behind on your nutrition, you're going to impact your growth. And, and it is a domino effect that occurs. The child may go through the transition and turn into a picky eater or if they're having more significant issues, they may turn into a problem feeder. And, and we'll be talking about the difference between those two, picky eaters and problem feeders. We are not the major cause of our children's feeding problems. Um, as we talked about, it's really 5 to 7% of the time are we the actual cause of our child's feeding problems. What is actually going on is that your child hasn't gained the skills and the physical capacity, capability to do this task of eating the diet that you want them to do. That's what's going on. So there are things that we can do as parents that make it better. And these are the things we need to do because we can also do things to make it worse. And we also do things as parents accidentally that maintain our children's feeding difficulties. And we don't want to be doing that either. So what are some of the things we really need to think about what we're doing? What is our mealtime structure? What is our routine? And what is our feeding schedule? And a feeding schedule is actually important. Are we a good role model? If your spouse comes home and says, are we having that again tonight for dinner? I can guarantee you, your child isn't going to eat whatever that is either, <laughs> okay? We need to be good role models. We need to think about the foods we're serving the child and how we prepare it to make sure our child can actually eat it with the skills they currently have. And that's probably the biggest mistake we make as parents. We assume our kids can eat foods that they don't actually have the skills for. And that's very frustrating to a child who wants to eat and you give them something they can't manage. How we talk to our kids is very, very important. And so we'll be looking at what are some things we can do to improve the way we talk to our kids and stop power struggling about eating. Because once you start power struggling, Everybody loses. Everybody loses. So let's step back and look at some of these organ system issues. Let's look at some of these physical issues. So as I said, the body's number one priority is not eating, it's breathing. So that's number one. Postural stability is number two. So we want to think about from an organ system standpoint that respiratory is number one. When you look at children who have feeding difficulties, who have medical complications, the number one cause of medical feeding problems is respiratory. That's number one. Cardiac and GI are number two and three in that order. 
I want you to think about the last time that you had a really bad head cold. How you eat a few bites and then you have to stop and breathe. And then you take a few more bites and you have to stop and breathe again. And after about the third time, you're like, yeah, I'm not doing this anymore. I'm too tired. I can't smell. I can't taste. This isn't worth my time. I'm not doing this anymore. That's what happens to kids too. So whether your child currently has a respiratory issue, perhaps they have environmental allergies, perhaps they have asthma, they have reactive airway disease, they have a cold, they have sinusitis, they have chronic runny nose. All of those things are big red flags for respiratory challenges. Because if my nose is clogged up, I've clogged up an airway. And, and babies, especially under the age of six months, are what we call obligate nose breathers. Babies can't actually breathe out of their mouths. You have, to, that's why you have to suction the goo out with that little bulb syringe, is because if you don't clear the nasal passages, they won't be able to breathe, literally. Um, and it has to do with the anatomy, and the anatomy changes. So if your child was born premature, and your child was on oxygen for a long period of time, your child's lungs are likely immature. And even though they are no longer on oxygen, that immature lung may today be impacting their respiratory status. And breathing always comes first. We see kids all the time who are born up in the mountains. Uh, they come down here to Denver to the NICU. We have them eating. They're growing fine. We send them back home to the mountains, and they stop gaining weight. The easiest intervention we can do is give them blow by oxygen, where we just take an oxygen cannula, stick it on the end of the high chair, have the mom wear the cannula around her neck, cut the prongs off. We enrich the immediate oxygen environment of the child, and they will eat better and gain weight. Why? Because if I can't breathe well, the way I compensate as a young child by, is by increasing my respiratory rate and my breathing has to get faster and faster and faster. The faster I breathe, the harder it is for me to eat. The faster I have to breathe, the less likely I'm gonna to be to put something in my mouth, especially if I can now breathe through my mouth because it blocks one of my other airways. And because I'm breathing so quickly, I am burning a huge amount of calories. And simply by enriching the immediate oxygen environment, we can improve your child's weight gain because they're getting easy access to the oxygen. They don't have to increase respiratory rate. And this is why cardiac children have feeding difficulties as well, is because if you have a cardiac issue, your, bo your body is not pumping the oxygen throughout your system uh, correctly. And so you will see those kids fatigue very rapidly, and they can't maintain the energy uh, to eat to grow. GI, of course, if every time you eat it hurts, if every time you eat somebody's feeding you something that you're actually allergic to and you're vomiting, you are going to learn eating makes me vomit. If every time you eat you're in pain because you have gastroesophageal reflux, you're going to learn that eating makes you hurt. So if every time you eat it hurts, you're going to learn to not eat. People make the mistake and think that children will always eat. If it hurts, they don't eat. If it doesn't work right, they don't eat. It doesn't matter that you're supposed to do it. And of course, if you can't absorb your calories, you're not gonna be able to grow either. These are the other organ systems that are involved in the process of eating. So all of these things could be part of why a child is not eating. Um, and if your child has currently a medical disorder or they had one when they were younger, that medical problem could still be impacting their eating today. Even if a surgeon came in and corrected the cardiac, even if a surgeon came in and corrected your esophageal issues, when you have a surgery done, it creates scar tissue, especially if you have any GI or esophageal surgery, and it changes the motility of your gastrointestinal tract. All of these things can still be playing a role. If they had this medical issue for a long time and they learned that eating didn't work well, you may fix the medical problem, but they've still got learned avoidance behaviors from when it wasn't going well that you have to figure out how to undo. 
So, so go back and think about your child's early history. As we talked about, breathing is number one, not falling on your head is number two, or what we refer to as postural stability. What we know is children with muscle problems, such as low normal muscle tone, um, low muscle tone, hypotonia, cerebral palsy, are going to be challenged in staying in a stable, upright, seated position that allows them to eat well. You only have so much motor brain power available to you at any one time. And if you are expending all your motor brain power to make sure you're not going to fall on your head, you don't have enough left over to make your mouth work correctly. And that's a big problem. The number one intervention you can do as a parent is to get your child into the correct seated position. It is the first recommendation we give every family who walks through our door. So we're going to be telling you, showing you, having you experience what the incorrect position is and what the correct position is. These are some of the things you want to look for your child doing to give you an indicator that your child may be having postural instability. So children with postural instability slouch. Now we all eventually learn to slouch, but um, if you think about when a baby learns to sit, they have beautiful posture once they learn to sit, don't they? For quite a while. It takes a while before we learn to slouch. They are going to prop while they're sitting. They put their elbow on the table. They put their hands on the table. They put their feet on the table. <laughs> So um, they are going to prop. They're going to do what we call joint locking and fixing, and we're going to feel some of this. They will fall out of chairs. They will fall out of high chairs. They will not self-feed. They prefer to stand and eat. They prefer to walk around and eat. And they appear stronger than they are because of joint locking or fixing. What children do is, is children are going to attempt to compensate for their tone issues. And the place and way that children compensate if they're having muscle tone issue is by using their joints and their bones to do the job of the muscles. And, and Lindsay, let's actually do the standing one first, and then I'll let you sit down sideways. So one of the things that I like to do with families to help drive this point home is I like to stand side by side uh, with the stronger of the family parent. Um, and uh, we are going to push against each other. Now, I have low normal muscle tone. Um, and you can see Lindsay's going to very easily push me over because she has normal tone. What I'm going to do is cheat. I'm going to lock up all of my joints, all of my bones. She can push as much as she wants against my bones, and her muscles aren't going to move me because you can't, bones win. Um, joints win. What I did is I locked my wrist, I locked my elbow, I locked my shoulder. What you can't see is I have my hip locked, I have my knee locked, I have my ankles locked, and I have a wide base of support. So I am cheating. And that's what you're going to see kids who have feeding challenges, tone issues do. We like to talk about this idea that we cannot forget as adults that children are organized more simply than we are. If it hurts, you cry. If it makes you mad, you throw it on the floor. If you're frustrated, you scream. If you don't like somebody, you hit them. If it's hard work, you either run away or you cheat. That's what you do when you're a young child. We actually don't learn to do things just because it's good for us until after seven years of age. Below then, if it's hard work, I'm either going to run away or I'm going to cheat. Now, you all know adults, I'm sure, who still function at this level. However, we should move past that starting at about the age of seven. But this is why it's challenging to get your young kids to do things that you think are good for them. They don't have the logic ability to do something just because it's good for them. 
Think about how easy is it to convince your child to go to the pediatrician to get their annual injections. Okay, like that makes sense to them. I'm supposed to be happy about you putting a big old needle in my arm? <laughs> that makes no sense to them. They don't have that kind of logic to be able to do that. So let's talk a little bit about sitting. And I'm going to have you do a sitting exercise. And I'm going to have Lindsay do a sitting exercise as well. So the first thing that I'm going to want to have you guys do is I'm going to ask you to take your feet off the floor. So I need you to think about taking your feet off the floor. I need your elbows off the table as well. And I want you to take your feet off the floor. And I want you to think about what did you just do? Most of you sat up a little better. If you're not sitting upright and you're slouching, I need you to also sit upright for me. Think about what do you do to sit upright and be able to take your feet off the floor. So put them up in front of you like Lindsay's doing. Hopefully what you did is you scooched your hind end to the back of the chair. You sucked in your belly muscles. You pulled up your chest muscles. And at first you probably put your feet on the floor until I told you you couldn't do that. With your feet off the floor, you are completely reliant on your core for your postural stability, aren't you? We make children sit for 20 to 30 minutes, four to six times a day, relying completely on their core with no foot support. This is what we do to kids. So what do kids do to try to compensate? Because they're literally not grounded. So, and especially if I have low tone, what do they do? They're going to try to compensate. One place they can lock is the hips. If they lock through their hips and there is no pummel between their legs, what's going to happen? They're going to slide right out. You are exactly correct. They're going to slide right out of their chair. And what kind of chair do we put kids in? We want it to be washable. So it's plastic, it's slippery, and God forbid you have them in a little velour tracksuit and you put them in a slippery chair. They're just gonna go whoop and right on the floor. And we actually had a child do that in the feeding clinic one day. It was like, ah, <laughs> whoops. <laughs> we need a little better support <laughs> for that. Now. Most kids are pretty smart. They figure out pretty quickly, I can't lock up my hips or I'm going to fall out of the chair. So where else can I lock? Hopefully your feet are still off the floor and your elbows are off the table. One of the things kids do is they will prop. That's what you're doing by putting your elbows on the table. So the first place most kids are going to fix is through the shoulders. So what I want you to do is pretend you have a low core tone. I want you to slouch a little through your belly. And now I want you to pull your shoulders back until you feel more stable, okay? Once you're in this position, now I want you to feed yourself, okay? It is gonna be very hard for you to feed yourself. What kids do is they do what we refer to as the birdie. They want you to feed them because they can't feed themselves if they are fixing through their shoulder blades. And this is one of the main reasons why children don't self-feed. It is not because they're being a brat. It is because they have a postural stability issue and they need to fix. Now, some of our kids do what we call the T-Rex. They fix like this and they eat like this. So they fix around the front instead. What if I figured out, if I sit like this, I can't feed myself. Where else do I have to lock? So hopefully your feet are still off the floor. I want you to slouch a little through the belly. You're gonna slouch through your shoulders. Where do you have less to fix? You're already probably doing it. A lot of kids fix forward with their chin. Some kids will pull all the way back. Some kids will tilt up. Some kids will tilt down. You get into whichever position you feel more comfortable, whether it's up, down, back, forward. And now I want you to chew five times and I want you to take a dry swallow. Chew five times and take a dry swallow. Okay, now you can put your feet down. Thank you, Lindsay. So you should have just seen how incredibly uncomfortable that was to attempt to chew when you're fixing through your jaw and your neck and how difficult it is to swallow. 
So postural stability is number one. And what we need to do to support our children's eating is get them in what we call the 90-90-90 position. 90 degrees at the hips, 90 degrees at the knees, 90 degrees at the ankles. And what that means is our child must have a foot support. They must have a foot support. Very young infants aren't going to use a foot support, um, but foot support can help a young infant if they're struggling to eat, but they must be grounded. So one of the challenges if they're sitting in an adult chair is that an adult chair is too long for them from butt to knee. And so when they sit in an adult chair, their knees don't drop over the front of the chair and they cannot get in a 90 degree angle. That's a significant problem. If you're gonna put them in an adult chair, if you're gonna put them in a booster seat, you need to put something stable behind them to support their back and bring them far enough forward that their knees drop over the front of the chair at a 90 degree angle regardless of how old they are. Then what you need to do is you need to build a foot support for them. That's what we're looking for. So we want 90 degrees at the hips, 90 degrees at the knees, 90 degrees at the ankles. So we'll be looking at some chair choices here in just a minute. For very young babies who are first learning to eat solid foods, somewhere around five to seven months of age, they are not going to have the best seating abilities yet. Babies learn to sit independently about five months of age, but they're not really very good at it till closer to six to seven months of age. So for those children, we prefer them to be in an infant feeding chair of some sort where they are going to be slightly tilted backwards so that it takes the pressure off the neck and it allows them to rest more comfortably and be slightly tilted backwards. The child between seven to eight months and 14 to 16 months at the latest should be in some kind of infant feeding chair or a high chair. So this is what we're going to be thinking about for an infant feeding chair. We want them completely upright. We don't want them tilted back anymore. They need to sit completely upright. And you need to arrange these infant feeding chairs in a way that they're Knees are at 90 degrees off the end of this chair and they have a foot support. So you're gonna to have to figure out how to make that happen. Or you can think about a high chair. Now, personally, I tell families don't ever buy a high chair. They're, they're kind of a waste of money and they're a waste of time. Why? Because most high chairs are not set up to be developmentally appropriate for the size of most children. The tray is too far up because the other thing is the correct height for a table or tray surface is halfway between the belly button of the breast nipples. And when you put most infants in a high chair, the tray is at their chin. That is not an appropriate seating arrangement. You're gonna to have to put something under their bum to lift them up and it has to be something hard and stable. And a lot of times, the distance from butt to knee in the chair is not the right distance. And I have no idea who makes foot rests for these kids. They think the kids have the longest shins on the planet. Um, most of the kids' feet come nowhere near the foot rest. So, so personally, we recommend that families go from these directly into these. That's what we recommend. And if they are older than 14 to 16 months of age, they should go to one of these types of chairs, um, ideally. These are 100% adjustable wooden chairs. They are not cheap. What I will tell you is you can go to overstock.com, you can go to the parent free exchanges, you can go to eBay, you can go to garage sales and find these chairs because your biggest bang for your buck from a feeding intervention standpoint is to get your child in the 90, 90, 90 position. You will be shocked at how much better your child eats, how much better they stay in the chair and stop escaping from the meal. After 14 to 16 months of age, your child has to be out of the high chair 
and they better not have a high chair tray in front of them. High chair trays perpetuate throwing. Don't keep them in the high chair. If your child throws and they're in a high chair, get them out of the high chair. Get rid of that high chair tray. If I don't want a food, I can only get it this far away from me. So it's better to chuck it. If I'm sitting at a table, we can help them push it outside their arm's reach so they're still looking at it and learning about it and they haven't chucked it on the floor. So, so these are the chairs we want to see after 14 to 16 months of age. These are 100% adjustable. They grow with your child. And you can have your child sit in these chairs until about the age of 10. Uh, so, so they are very durable. When you buy these chairs, if you purchase these chairs, if you rent these chairs, wherever you get these chairs, you must make sure you adjust it correctly. If you don't adjust it correctly, you have just completely wasted your money. And I can't tell you how many families I see who have these chairs who don't have them adjusted correctly. Um, you need to make sure that first the seat is at the correct height for your child to be sitting with the table surface coming halfway between the belly button and the breast nipples. Then you need to move this seat forward or backwards enough that their entire thigh is supported by the seat. Don't push it back so far like this so that they're sitting on their butt bones. They'll fall forward in the chair. So the entire thigh is to be supported with the knees dropping over the front end. Once you get that position correctly, then you adjust the footrest to make sure that it's the correct height for your child to be at 90 degrees at their ankles and knees and to pull it far enough forward that their entire foot is supported by the platform of the footrest, okay? You can absolutely recreate these yourself. I have done it many a times. Go to Joann's, Michael's, Hobby Lobby. You buy the uh, couch cushion, the foam stuff that you would use to make your own couch cushions. And, and you can create these kinds of arrangements. Uh, we have done things like use cement blocks for footrests. Uh, my favorite actually is to take a bunch of old phone books, if you still own any, or very old magazines or books that you don't want anymore, and you build a stack that's tall enough for your child's feet to be at the 90 degrees at the ankles, and then you duct tape the whole entire thing um, so that you have this heavy weighted, a little on the sticky side, footrest. <laughs> and it's washable, <laughs> so that works really well. You don't have to spend this money, but the issue is your child is gonna grow enough from butt to knee and knee to ankles every three months that you have to adjust these chairs. And if you've done a homemade seating arrangement, you must be adjusting your child's seating arrangement at least once every three months, okay? so. Some other things you can do that is very helpful, especially since you're not gonna haul these kind of chairs with you over to grandma's house or out to a restaurant or on vacation, is you're gonna go out and buy a roll of this rubber made no skid matting. The stuff that you stick in your kitchen drawers to keep your utensils in place or under your glassware or the stuff you stick under your rugs to keep your rugs in place. It works really well to keep kids' butts in place too. And you just fold it up, stick it in your pocket, stick it in your diaper bag, stick it in your purse, and you just carry one with you. And so you have them on all of their seats at home and you carry one with you. So when you go to a restaurant, you just pull this out and put it in whatever seat they give you for your child, whatever bench they're sitting on, whatever booth you're sitting in, whatever adult chair they put your child in. It will hold your child's bum in place so that they can at least lock up at their hips and have their upper body free to feed themselves. I want you to think about the last time you went to uh, a bar or you went to a restaurant that had a tall top table and you got the stool, the tall chair that had no rung to it. 
How incredibly annoying is that? What do you do? Well, you start by swinging your feet, and then you fidget everywhere, and then you put your arm on the back of the chair, and then you lean on the bar, and pretty soon you have one butt cheek on the chair, one foot on the floor, and then you're like, yeah, I'm standing. I can't do this anymore. That is exactly what your child's doing. If your child won't sit still at a meal, you have a postural stability issue. If they look like they have ants in their pants at the meal, you have a postural stability issue. Get them in the 90-90-90 position. The number one first recommendation is fix your child's chair. You may, if you buy one of the adjustable wooden chairs, need to create side supports. It's the one thing I don't like about these chairs is they have no side supports. Yoga blocks are an easy side support. Uh, Lindsay is great at creative ways to come up with making all sorts of things for kids. What she does is take Kleenex boxes, tissue, nose tissue boxes, fills them with dry beans, and then she duct tapes the whole thing closed. Makes a great side support. Um, you can throw them out if they get too slimy. You can use them as building blocks for your kids. You can use them as a step stool. You can use them as a footrest. So think about making the adjustments you need to. So here are some other pictures of some adjustments. Here is an adjustment for a child who is sitting in a child feeding chair, a booster seat. And so they have set it up so that she's upright, she has side supports, and they have therabanded her footrest to her chair so that she is in the right position. And then this is an example of an older child. He's sitting in an adult chair, but they have put uh, a very hard cushion insert behind him to get his knees over the front. And then his dad is very clever. And these are two wooden blocks under the legs of the chair. He built these two blocks up to get um, his son at the right height. So the table surface is halfway between the belly button and the breast nipples. And then he actually built a foot rest and attached it to the two legs of the chair. Now, it's, the footrest isn't wide enough, but that is really clever. <laughs> and so we only have to tweak that just a smidge and get him to put a, a wooden um, flat block on this footrest so his foot is fully supported. So that's what we would like to see you guys be thinking about doing. Some other physical things we need to think about is sensory tolerance. As I told you, we have eight senses, not five, like you learn in school. Most of us think about from a feeding standpoint that we see our food, we smell our food, we taste our food. We forget that how the food feels in our mouth oftentimes makes a difference. Think about if you're eating an egg salad sandwich and you get an eggshell in your sandwich, or you're eating scrambled eggs and you get an eggshell. In, in your sandwich, or you're eating a lovely piece of steak and you get a massive piece of gristle, or you're eating a, a nice piece of fish and you get a bone. How off-putting is that texture? Very off-putting, very off-putting. So how the food feels is really critical. We also forget that you hear your food in your head. We have children who come to our clinic who will not eat certain foods and they will tell you it's because they're too noisy. And there are actually labs around the world by food manufacturers that the whole purpose of the lab is to study at what decibel crunch do you hear a food in your head and decide it's fresh versus stale. Okay, <laughs> this is true science. But one of the reasons why I put this extremely simplified picture of the brain up is because I need you to understand that each of your senses are processed predominantly in a different part of your brain. And that what you have to have is each of these sensory systems working correctly, individually, and then you literally have to grow eight to the eighth brain pathways between every one of these different eight senses to the other one of the eight senses. That is literally hundreds of thousands of pathways you have to grow to have sensory integration. And to eat, you need to be able to process multi-sensory stimulation. 
Food and eating is the epitome of multisensory stimulation. So here are what we call your external environmental senses. And this is your internal uh, information, your internal sensory inputs. Proprioception is information from your muscles and your joints. Your proprioceptive system tells you how light something is, how heavy something is, what kind of texture something is, what kind of surface I'm walking on, standing on. Your proprioceptive system gives you input about your body's movement in space. It is also the most calming of all the sensory inputs you can give your child. So when you get a massage, it's not the person digging at your notch that feels good. It's the deep pressure that you get into the muscles and joints. It's the most calming of all your sensory inputs. Vestibular is your sense of balance. If you are walking down a set of stairs and you think there's another step coming and there's not, most people talk about, I, I almost lost my balance. Well, that's not exactly right. You actually disrupt proprioception first, and then you have three to five seconds to catch yourself before you lose your balance. And that's why sometimes you fall and sometimes you don't fall. Why did you disrupt proprioception? Because your body was ready for a certain amount of pressure from your ankle, your knee, your hip, your calf, and your thigh. And when that didn't happen, it disrupts your proprioception and then that throws you off balance. So it's proprioception first, then vestibular and balance. And interoception is the eighth sense that most of us, even if we are taught about sensory, are not aware of. But interoception is the eighth sense. And we do have some occupational therapists who do not understand the role of interoception. If you are doing feeding, you have to be talking about interoception. Interoception is your ability to read your internal body signals. And there are six of them. The first one I'm gonna to talk to you about is appetite and thirst. Your ability to read when you're hungry, when you're full, when you're thirsty, when you've had enough to drink. Sleep regulation. Can you get to sleep? Can you stay asleep? Can you go through the sleep cycles appropriately? If your child is having sleep disturbance, you may have an interoception issue. Toileting, do I know when to go? Do, can I hold it until it's an appropriate time to go? Or, or do I not know I need to go until it's an emergency? And then I'm like, oh, no, I have to go now. <laughs> Um, and, and it's not because I've just been playing along, ignoring it. Those kids you know, know, have to go to the bathroom. They're doing the potty dance, okay? I'm talking about the kid who doesn't know until the input's so big that they're at urgent state, okay? The child who still wets the bed at four, five, six, seven years of age. That's a child who is not reading the interoceptive cues around toileting. Temperature recognition and temperature control. Can, am I hot when everyone else is cold? Cold when everyone else is hot, okay? These are the kids who go out in the middle of winter in their bare feet with no clothes on and try to tell you they're perfectly fine and not cold. <laughs> and you can see they're getting frostbit and they'll still tell you they're perfectly fine and not cold, okay? Illness recognition. These kids are gonna go and go and go like energizer bunnies. They crash, you take their temperature, it's like 104. And you think, oh my God, I'm the worst parent on the planet. How did I not know this kid was this sick? It's not that you didn't know they were this sick, they didn't know they were that sick. Or they have an ear infection, you don't know it until they burst the eardrum and there's blood coming out of their ear. Um, so, and then the sixth is emotion regulation. Your emotions are an internal sensory experience. And children who have problems with emotion regulation may be having an interoceptive issue. They go from zero to outraged in two seconds flat. They don't have the normal cycle of human emotions. Human emotions occur in the shape of a bell curve. You live out at that long tail, you escalate, you come to a peak, and you calm down the backside of the curve. That is how human emotions are supposed to happen. 
related to this whole idea is the fact that eating is not a two-step process. You do not sit down and eat. That is not how eating happens. For children who have feeding difficulties, eating on average is a 32-step process. If you have a typically developing child, they may learn to eat a new food in 20 to 25 steps. Children who have feeding difficulties, the average is 32. If you have a child on the autism spectrum, your child probably has closer to 40 to 60 steps in their steps to eating hierarchy. And eating begins with sensory processing. This is why the majority of children who have sensory processing issues also struggle with eating because eating begins with sensory processing. It begins with being able to visually tolerate the food, then you interact with it. Interacting with the food means I do something to the food to manipulate it and change it without directly touching it to my skin. So I'm going to use my vestibular and my proprioceptive systems here. That's what I'm using in interacts with. So I stir it, I poke it, I pour it, I dump it, I chop it, I use a knife on it. Those are all interacts with, no direct skin contact yet. Then comes smell. Now smell overlaps in both directions. But what we find therapeutically for some children is we have to get through these two major steps first with foods that have no scent to them before we work on smell. And for some kids, touch actually comes before smell. It depends on the child. But typically, it's smell, then touch. And touch starts with fingertip, fingertips, whole hand, arms, chest, top of the head, outside of the face, inside of the face, lips, teeth, and then tongue is all touch. Your taste system is a chemoreception system. It takes you between one and five seconds to process flavor, unless there is a big burn or a big sour to it. You process touch first. If your child touches a food to their lips and gags, that is a tactile overreaction. It is not a hypersensitive gag reflex. It is not the flavor. Your lips don't have taste buds. Um, if it touches their tongue and they gag, you have to decide if they're having a tactile overreaction or if you are having a taste overreaction or if you accidentally hit their gag reflex. So, so taste is going to come in on board after that. Um, taste starts by getting it and just touching it with the tip of your tongue to barely get a taste, then licking it with your tongue, getting it inside your mouth and spitting it out, putting it inside your mouth and holding it for a long time and spitting it out, getting it in your mouth, actually chewing it up a bit and spitting out those pieces. Because as soon as you break a food molecule, as soon as you break down textured table foods, you are changing the flavor. So I want you to think about eating a saltine cracker. If you're eating a saltine cracker, every time you chew that cracker, it is going to look different in your mouth, if you were looking inside your mouth. Every time you chew that cracker, it is going to feel different in your mouth. Nobody chews with their head perfectly still. We all have to move our head a fraction of a millimeter when we chew. So every time we chew, we have to adjust our vestibular sense of balance. We all just do it so automatically we don't think about it. I, I dare you to go home and eat an entire meal without moving your head ever a fraction of a millimeter while you're trying to chew. Um, you then, while you're chewing, every time you chew because you're breaking apart those food molecules, the smell is actually changing. You have scent receptors in the back of your throat. It's why when you go to the movie theater, you think, wow, I can almost taste that popcorn. Oh, actually, you are tasting that popcorn. You are. Um, because you have scent receptors in the back of your mouth. So every time you chew, you get a different smell. Every time you chew, you get a different taste. It starts out very salty. It gets more and more starchy, more and more bready as it mixes with the saliva. 
Every time you chew, you have to figure out what's the stretch on my esophagus, what's the stretch on the stretch receptors of my stomach, have I eaten enough that I need to be full now, I, have I um, uh, released my satiation peptides, that interoception piece is extremely complicated. What is the blood glucose level in my body? That's all the stuff you have to read. Every time a child eats textured table food, the sight changes, the smell changes, the touch changes, the sound changes from loud to quiet. That was the one I left out. Vestibular balance changes, interoception changes, and you have to use a different amount of jaw pressure. There are only two human behaviors in which you have to simultaneously integrate eight new pieces of information every time you chew. Well, not every time you chew, every time you move. The two human behaviors where we have to simultaneously integrate eight new pieces of information is eating and procreation. That's it. So eating and sex, those are the two things we do as human organisms that are that complicated from a sensory standpoint. Hopefully your kids are not procreating yet, and so eating is the thing that they're doing that's, that's complicated from a sensory standpoint. Now what we know about the oral motor skills we need is that there is this shift in appetite around four to six weeks, and then at four to six months there's even a bigger shift. Your reflexes go away, and you have a whole anatomy change as well. Little bitty babies are what we call vertically compressed. That's what gives them their little baby face. Around four to six months of age, the jawbone grows down and forward. As a result, the tongue no longer fills the entire oral cavity. So below four to six months of age, the tongue is filling my entire oral cavity. As my jawbone grows down and forward, there is now a space between the top of my tongue and the roof of my mouth. And I have to have good oral motor skills to bring the tongue up to squish the food into the palate and pull the food backwards for the swallow. Or I have to move the food to the side, get it on my back teeth, and be able to chew it up properly. Because we don't swallow textured table foods across the middle of our tongue. Because I need to be able to take food from the front of my mouth that's textured and lateralize it to my back molar. So you can take a cracker, you could take a cookie, um, you can have some apple. Um, and so uh, don't eat it yet. I'll tell you how I want you to eat it in just a minute. People misunderstand how we eat. We do not swallow textured table foods across the middle of our tongue. The only foods we swallow from the middle of our tongues is purees and fluids. Um, and and uh, we don't swallow textured table food from the middle of our tongue. What we have to do is take the food bite from the front of our mouth and lateralize it to the back molars by doing what we call tongue tip lateralization and then we have to be able to chew it up correctly. The correct placement for food is on the back molar. Your best pressure is at the apex or the fulcrum of an angle. You don't have good pressure at the front of your mouth. Your best pressure is at the jaw joint, okay? So that's what we need to think about doing here. All right, so. I'm going to have you do a little exercise here. I think most everybody has something that, that they can eat. I'm going to tell you how to eat it first. Don't take the bite and try to eat it until I tell you what to do, okay? So when I say go, what I'm going to want you to do is to take a normal size bite of food, chew it up five times. Actually, because it's a cookie, it'll break apart easier. Let's chew it only three times maybe four, um, and then I, what I want you to do is I want you to put all those pieces right smack dab in the very center of your tongue, and I want you to swallow it th from there. So I, I don't want you to chew it up until it's liquid. Don't have it be in big, hard pieces that are going to hurt you either, though. So, so go ahead and do that. I want you to take a, a normal size bite, 
chew it up only three to five times, and then I want you to take all the pieces and stick them right smack dab in the middle of your tongue. And you guys at home can do this with a cracker, with a cookie. You should be struggling with this because we don't swallow big pieces of food across the middle of our tongue. What I want you to do for me now, we're gonna do two different ways to cheat. If you already got it down, you cheated one of these two ways. What most of you are doing that I see is I want you to close your mouth down really tight and I want you to squish and swish this, add in a little spit and liquefy it, turn it into a fluid and then you should be able to swallow it down, okay? That is one way that we cheat. So if you're watching your child eat something and their lips thin out and disappear and their jaw starts going <laughs> and you see their cheeks start to suck in, your child is not chewing. They are squishing and swishing and sucking. That is not chewing, it's not. So now we're going to do another one. So um, don't take another bite quite yet or clear any bites you have. This time we're gonna do the same exercise. Take a normal bite of food, chew it up, three to four times, put the pieces in the center of your tongue. And this time what I want you to do is I want you to smash all the pieces into the roof of your mouth. And I want you to see what your tongue has to do to move that ball of food backwards for the swallow. So go ahead and take your bite, chew it up three to four times, take all the pieces, put them right smack dab in the center of your tongue. And now take your tongue and mash it up into the roof of your mouth until you think it's soft enough that you can get it down. What you should see first is your jaw is going forward back. That is always an abnormal jaw movement. Is your, if you see your child's jaw going forward and back, they are not chewing their food. The other thing most of you just did, which you may or may not have realized, is you actually pushed your tongue forward outside the front of your lips to push that ball of food backwards, okay? And so if you're watching your child eat and you see the little tip of their tongue pop out of the front of their mouth, they didn't chew their food. They just smashed it into the roof of their mouth and they're using a forward tongue push to propel the ball of food backwards. That's what they did. Now we're gonna do another way wrong first before I let you do it correctly. This time, you're gonna take your normal bite of food, but you are only gonna chew it on your very front teeth. And then you are gonna to turn to the person next to you and see what your lips are doing, okay? So go ahead and do that. Take a normal bite of food, chew it only on your front teeth. Don't let it go past your front teeth. And I want you to turn to the people who are next to you and see what your lips are doing or look at yourself in a mirror, okay? You guys are being lovely, polite, people and you're making little kissy faces at each other, okay? The reason why your lips are puckered up is because we don't chew on our front teeth. You rabbit munch on your front teeth. You can do that with a cookie. You cannot do this with a piece of steak or a carrot. You can't do that and get it down. But if you did not have good lip closure, what you would have done is taken your bite and as you chewed it on your front teeth, food would have started dribbling down your face and down your shirt, okay? So if you're watching your child eat and all of a sudden, whoop, food just flies out of the blue, out of their mouth, it's because it was too far forward and they weren't actually chewing their food. They were rabbit munching it is what they were doing. All right, so this next time I'm going to let you do it correctly, but I'm going to make you watch for six different steps, okay? I'm gonna make you watch for six different steps. So this time, don't do it yet. What I'm gonna have you do is take a little bit smaller bite than your normal size bite. Don't take a microscopic thing, but take a little bit smaller. At, don't do it yet. What you're gonna watch for is six different steps. When you take your bite, what part of your tongue does it come on to? Where did you move it to? How did you get it there? Where are you chewing it at? How are you keeping it in place? And where do you actually swallow it from? Because that's how complicated it is. And I will talk you through that as you do this. So go ahead and take your bite and chew it up normally. But watch as it comes in your mouth. What part of your tongue did it come on to? 
Where did you move it to and how did you get it there? Where are you actually chewing it at and how are you keeping it in place? And then where do you actually swallow it from? That's what I'm looking to have you guys do for me. So if you have really good skills, what you should see is that what you did is you took the food onto the front approximately tip of your tongue approximately. Then what you did is you did what we call a tongue tip lateralization to move the food from the front to the back molar you should have been chewing on your back molars. One of your last two molars should have been where you were chewing. As you were chewing, you should have been able to feel the side of your tongue and the inside of your cheek working together to hold the food in place on top of your teeth. And then when you went to swallow, you should have swallowed from that back corner pocket across the back of your tongue and down your throat, okay? but that tongue tip lateralization is key. And if you will for me, just go ahead and take the tip of your tongue and put it on your last molar, like you're trying to clean the cookie or the cracker out of your last molar, that movement that you're doing is a tongue tip lateralization. It is the key movement to eat real meat, hard raw fruits with peels and hard raw vegetables, because you have to get the food onto the back molar in order to engage in a rotary chew. And a rotary chew goes down, around, up, shred. Down, around, up, grind. It's like a cow chewing its cut, okay? That's what you have to do to rend or pull apart the fibers in meat and fruits and vegetables, especially anything with a peel. That's what you have to be able to do. Now, just because you can talk does not mean your oral motor skills are okay. Because as far as we know, there is no word anywhere in any language on this planet where you are supposed to put the tip of your tongue on your back molar, okay? Because you cannot talk if you put the tip of your tongue on your back molar. So just because you can talk doesn't mean you can eat. To, to do tongue tip lateralization, you are gonna pull the back two quadrants of your tongue backwards. You are gonna contract one of the front quadrants. You are going to extend the other of the front quadrant. So you are doing three different oral motor patterns with four quadrants of your tongue that are controlled by two different sides of your brain. It is an extremely sophisticated neuromuscular task. And your right tongue is controlled by your right brain. Your left tongue is controlled by your left brain. In the body, it is contralateral control. Right hand, left brain. Left hand, right brain. I can move my right and left hand, right and left leg separate from one another. I can't move my right and left tongue separate from one another. They're interconnected. So if you have a child who has motor challenges, this is going to be difficult for them. So in doing this set of exercises, um, we just did a number of these slides that are gonna come along here. But I wanted to do it kind of in one big smooth flowing piece. You can eat the rest of your cracker or cookie if you would like to now. Um, I'm done with ya. <laughs> so, so we've been talking about this piece, appetite instinct, then primitive motor reflexes, and then those reflexes go away, and eating is a learned behavior. And after six months of age, your choices are you learn to eat, you learn to not eat, you learn to kind of sort of eat. That's what you're gonna see happen. So we need to change the way we think about our role at the table. If eating is a learned behavior after six months of age and our child isn't eating well, that means that, that your child needs to be taught to eat. So I want you guys to stop coming to the table being dietitians. okay? We have dietitians who are great at their job. We're going to let them do it. We, I don't want you coming to the table worried about how much they're eating. I don't want you to come to the table wondering if they've gotten enough cal calcium or enough vitamin D. I need you to come to the table as a professor, as a teacher. Your job at the table is to teach 
your child how to eat. Every meal is class. You are the professor, your child is the student, and food is your subject. And I want you to think about who are the best professors that you've had over your academic career. Is it the professor who said, sit down, shut up, do it like this? Of course not. That is not the kind of professor you want to learn from, is it? The kind of professor who is the best professor who makes you interested in the subject is the one who sits and eats with you. They do everything with you. They make it fun. They laugh. They tell jokes. They make it interesting. They let you play. They let you manipulate things. That's the kind of professor I need you to be. I don't want you to be that boring professor. I don't want you to be the professor who sits and reads the newspaper while you are supposed to be reading your chapter in your physics book, okay? You need to sit and eat with the kids and have the same experience that they do. So that means to teach your child, you better show up to class, which means you sit down on your backside and you eat with your child. No books, no newspaper, no iPads, no iPhones. You need to be 100% fully present as that professor because they don't know how to do this. And you're going to have to show them and tell them using big, over-exaggerated movements. Look, it's all in front of my tongue. I have to move it to my strong back teeth. Watch. Ah. Ah, and then I can chew, 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 because you can get a heck of a lot of pressure behind your chew if you put your whole body behind it. And you can help your child learn better oral motor skills as a result. The other critical developmental shifts that are going to happen are going to be around 12 to 14 months of age. There is a shift in flavor perception. For very young babies, all their flavor comes into the back of their tongue. So in young babies, the taste buds that are most active are the ones on the back of the tongue, the back of the roof of the throat, uh, the back of the roof of the mouth, the back of the throat, the uvula, that's that little hangy downy thing in the back of your mouth. And, and that's where their flavor perception is. That's why they drink things like formula and don't think it's bad, okay? When their flavor perception in the back of the tongue is sour, bitter, salty. We eat things across the front of our tongue. When I drink off the front of my tongue, it is literally different than if I'm sucking from a bottle or breast nipple. Okay, A bottle or breast nipple places the fluid in the back of your mouth. That's why in young infants, that's where their taste buds are most active. As they go to putting being spoon-fed, putting finger foods in their mouth, putting table foods in their mouth, drinking from cups, you are going to see around 12 to 14 months of age, their flavor perception shifts to the front of the mouth. The front of your mouth is sweet, salty, sour. And they stop wanting those boring baby food flavors. They want more sophisticated flavors because their flavor perception has changed. From about a year and a half to two and a half, your child is going to become self-aware. They are going to figure out that they are their own separate organism than you, their primary caregiver, and they're going to figure out that they are not only their own separate organism that's different than you, they're going to figure out who they are as their own separate person than you. And the best way for me to differentiate myself from you, my primary caregiver, my attachment figure, is by doing the exact opposite of what you want me to. This is why your two-year-old says, no, mine, me do. It's not because they're oppositional defiant. It's because the best way for me to tell who I am as a different person than you is to do the opposite of what you want me to. 
So if you have a two-year-old in your house, please do not dress everybody up in the same clothes for the Christmas picture. You will confuse the heck out of your two-year-old. And God forbid that you put the dog in the same outfit for the Christmas picture. You will really confuse them. Now who am I? Mom, dad, the dog, Joey, Susie? I don't know who I am. <laughs> They're trying to figure that out. And the best way to figure it out is to be do exactly the opposite. And I'm going to warn you, you are going to revisit this stage at 11 and 12 and 13. And this is why your early adolescent dyes their hair fuchsia and pierces all their body parts. Because they have to figure out not only who are they as different from you, their parents, they have to figure out who are they as their own person out in the world. And the best way to do that is to do the opposite of who you are. Don't make a fuss. You'll make the stage last longer. If you don't make a fuss, it will pass. I promise you, it will pass. But you need to practice here um, <laughs> first. OK. When kids make major cognitive shifts, there are three major mental leaps we take in intellectual functioning. The first one happens between two and three. The next one happens between five to seven. The next one happens between nine to 11. There are three major mental leaps, intellectual cognitive leaps we make. During these time ages, when we are shifting from one cognitive stage to the next, our sensory system goes into the tank. And even if we had pretty good sensory functioning to begin with, our sensory system stops working very well and everything starts to bug us and our clothes feel bad again and we don't want seams in our sock and refuse to take a shower because it's like a thousand needles pricking my skin and I'm only going to wear sweatpants and I'm not going on the sand this year because I'm in this cognitive shift and my sensory system's in the tank. And we see kids want to do what's called food jagging in this, these age ranges. Because a food jag is when you want to eat the same exact food prepared the same exact way over and over and over again. Because if you, my mom and dad, make me my perfect isosceles triangle, grilled cheese sandwich, no crust, lightly toasted, no black spots, only lightly brown, it has to be only the um, olive oil butter on the outside. It can't be regular margarine. It only can be one slice of only the orange Kraft American cheese, not the yellow, and not two slices at 98.6 degrees. I don't have to use my sensory brain to eat that food, do I? If you make something different, I have to turn on my sensory brain to eat that food. And this is one of the reasons why your child will not only want to eat the same food over and over again, they will get stuck on packaged food and potentially restaurant food. Because a packaged food manufacturer's job is to create the food and instructions in a way that no matter who makes it, it's exactly the same every time. The restaurant's job, especially if it's a fast food restaurant, is to make sure that the food is exactly the same every time. And if the food is my perfect exact same food, I don't have to use my sensory brain. And that's a challenge. Food jagging is a challenge. And the problem with food jags is eventually your child will get sick and tired of that food. And they will burn out on that food. And now you've lost pancakes out of their food repertoire. And then they jag on hot dogs and you lose hot dogs out of their repertoire. And then they jag on chicken nuggets and now those are gone. And what you're going to see happen is you often have a child who has more foods at the age of two than they do at the age of five. And one of the worst things you can do is to allow your child to food jag. Food jagging is how you take your child when they're two going through a cognitive shift and their sensory system goes into the tank and turn them into a picky eater. It's how when they hit the next cognitive shift at five, you're going to turn them into a problem feeder. So, so there are two to three, five to seven, nine to 11. Those are the time periods. In our program, over 30 years of doing the SOS approach to feeding, well, probably about 25 years solidly, 
Um, we have had eight kids come back to therapy who have graduated from therapy fully. Those eight children, every one of them, stopped eating again because their parents allowed them to food jag in one of those three time periods. You cannot let your kids food jag. So how do you deal with food jagging? What you want is to have your child eat their perfect version of their food only every other day. The only food they're allowed to jag on is milk. We don't see most kids burn out on milk, but I, do, I will tell you some children will do that. So we offer milk three to four times a day. I typically am gonna offer water once at a meal or snack and juice once a me or at a meal or snack because I don't want your kids burning out on their milk because they need that nutrition. But if they have a food today, they can't have it again today. And they can't have it tomorrow either. They have to wait until the day after tomorrow. This is why I had you make this food list that's in front of you. Because in order to get through two full days appropriately without repeating a food, your child needs to have 10 different proteins, 10 different starches, 10 different fruits or vegetables your child will eat on a regular basis. They need to have 30 different foods in their food repertoire. Because after 16 to 18 months of age, children should eat every two and a half to three hours during the day. The average number of meals is five. That means if I'm not gonna repeat a food and at every meal and snack, I should be offered and eating, ideally, a protein, a starch, a fruit or vegetable. That means I need five different proteins, five different starches, five different fruits and vegetables to get through day one and the same number to get through day two. That's where I need to have 10 different proteins, 10 different starches, 10 different fruits or vegetables um, in order to be able to prevent this food jagging and prevent burnout. So you want to look at your list and see how close or how far away is your child to this list, okay? So look at your food list and count up how many foods you have. Is your child falling in the picky eater or the problem feeder range? Does your child have more than 30 foods? Well, maybe your child has four proteins, 45 starches, and one fruit or vegetable. They still have more than 30 foods. They don't have enough proteins or fruits or vegetables, but they still have more than 30 foods. That would potentially be a picky eater. If your child has under 20 foods, they are in the problem feeder range. And I would be recommending that you have your child get connected to a feeding therapist because your child needs some assistance. What you're gonna see with typically developing eaters and the kids who are really and truly picky eaters, if they burn out on a food and you give them a break from that food for about two weeks, when you represent it, they will eat that food again. If your child is in the problem feeder range, if they burn out on a food and you give them a two week break, if you represent it to them after two weeks, they will either act like they have never seen it before in their lifetime, even though they just spent the last three years of their life living on peanut butter, honey and wheat bread sandwiches every day for school lunch, they will act like they have never seen it before in their lifetime, or they will act like it is the most evil, disgusting slime on the planet that you could possibly be serving them. And you will lose that food out of their food repertoire. That is what children who are problem feeders do. A picky eater, if you put a new food on their plate, they will do what I call piss and moan. They're gonna fuss at you, but they will eventually settle down and do something with the food. They likely won't eat it, but they'll do something with the food. Kids who are problem feeders, they have nuclear meltdowns. They're crying, screaming, throwing, running away, crawling under the table. Um, that's a problem feeder. Picky eaters, when you look at your nutrition categories, proteins, starches, fruits or vegetables, they have at least one food, ideally two or more, in each of those categories. Problem feeders have none in some of those nutrition categories or they're avoiding completely certain textures. They eat no purees. They eat nothing that's warm. They eat nothing that's cold, okay? 
That's what you're going to see with the problem feeder. A picky eater is going to add new foods into the repertoire closer to what a typical eater does, somewhere between 20, 25 steps. Your problem feeder is going to need the whole 32 or more. The picky eater typically eats with you, your family, but they're frequently eating a different meal than you are. A problem feeder not only is eating different foods, but they're typically being fed at a different time than the rest of the family members. That's a big red flag. They need to eat with you. They need a teacher at class. They shouldn't be eating by themselves. And kids should not be fed separate than adults. Your job is to teach them how to eat. That's your job. A picky eater, when you've been to their physician, at some well child checks, you're going to be stressed enough to be saying to the doc, I'm really struggling with getting them to eat. But other times you go to the appointments and eh, it's not so bad. We kind of have a handle on it, we think. With a problem feeder, every time you go to see that doc, you're complaining. I can't get this kid to eat. I can't get this kid to eat. Their grandma can't get them to eat. The nanny can't get them to eat. They don't eat at school. That's a problem feeder and that child needs to be seen for therapy. But I'm gonna very quickly run through the rest of what we call general treatment strategies or things we would like you guys to do in your home to have meals go better. And we've talked about a lot of these actually already. I'm just gonna give you them in a quick list. So the first one is you need to be a good role model. Show up to class. This is one of my favorite cartoons. Dinner's ready. Oh boy, what are we having tonight, mommy? Leftover enchiladas. Yay! First one who complains sets a bad example. Being a role model stinks. <laughs> yes, it does. But guess what? You're the grown up. You get to be the role model. And guess what else? You get to do it with a happy face, too, on top of it. Because if you're like, uh, your kid is going to do that, too. I tell families, mealtime, it's show and tell time. You need to slap on your happy face. Put on that grin and it stays the in place, okay? It stays in place. Talk about the food. So often we never talk about the food we're eating. What color is it? What size is it? What shape is it? You have to engage their brain with the food. Over-exaggerate the motor movement patterns like we just looked at, like I just showed you. Make sure you're teaching them how to do it. If you always chew with your mouth closed, all nice and polite, your child's going to think you're the coolest magician on the planet. You put food in your mouth and it disappears. Well, that's cool, especially if they're in magical thinking. We don't want to be focused on the child. Focus on the food. Focus on having a pleasant conversation. Focus on things that went well in your day, okay? We don't want meal times to be the time to talk about the fact that, that your oldest child got sent to the principal or that you had a flat tire or X, Y, or Z happened. Kids have emotional antennae. And when you're talking about difficult subjects at the meal time, their emotions are going to start to escalate. They are going to start to get stressed. And there is a big, big problem with stress and meal times. Because what we know is when you stress your child right before a meal or during a meal, you are going to activate their adrenaline system or their fight, flight, or fright system. Adrenaline is a very old system. It was designed to help you fight off a predator or run away from a predator in the primordial jungle. So if you're running away from a saber-toothed tiger, you don't want to stop and think about the fact you missed breakfast this morning or you're going to be breakfast for the tiger. So what happens when adrenaline kicks on, when you stress your child, you kick on their adrenaline, what happens is the adrenaline goes to the appetite centers of the brain and tells the brain to turn off your appetite. You stress your kids out, you're turning off their appetite. In addition, the adrenaline tells your body to shut down your digestive tract and to take all that blood from the digestive tract and shunt it out to your arms and legs so you can run or fight. And on top of that, you're shifting your child out of learning mode into react mode. And it will take them twice as long to learn anything when they're in a panic state than when they're calm. 
So one of the things that's unique about feeding is we as parents need to be aware of how stressed our kids are. And if you stress them out, you need to help calm them back down because otherwise you're just shooting yourself in the foot. We need to imitate your child's eating. Do you need to put food on your head? No, you don't need to go that far, um, <laughs> but you do need to imitate what they're eating. There are some great studies out there that show if you want your child to eat a new food and you are in the kitchen but not sitting and eating with them, they will not eat the new food. If you are sitting at the table with them and eating a different food than the new food you want them to eat, they won't eat that new food. The only time the child will eat that new food you want them to eat is when you're sitting at the table eating that same food with them. So you get to have some of all of their food, even if you don't like it. You get to at least be a good role model about learning about that food. We need to make sure that the food is fun. Do you, don't put a pile of you know, vegetables in front of them. Make it into something fun and interesting, especially if they're under the age of five. Otherwise, they're not gonna want to come to class. Why should I come to class if everything just looks bleh? Um, that's no fun. Involve your child in as many aspects of the mealtime prep as you can. Because this little girl um, who has cerebral palsy, she's standing in a CP standing tower, has some pretend food, but she has a real banana. So when she sits down to eat at the table, she is already starting way up on the steps to eating hierarchy. She's done all the visual steps. She's done all the interacts with steps. She's got all the smell steps under her belt. She's all the way up to whole hand. So when it's time to eat, she's starting at like step 20, not at step zero. So by the age of five, your child should be assisting you in cooking at least one meal a week for the family as your junior chef. By the age of seven, your child should be cooking at least one meal a week for your family, and you are the junior chef. Don't leave them unsupervised. <laughs> That's a disaster. But they need to be involved. We don't punish children at mealtimes. When you yell at them, when you nag at them, stop kicking your brother, don't chew with your mouth closed, take another bite, don't, you know, do whatever. When you are nagging at them, yelling at them, you are sending them into fight or flight, their adrenaline kicks in, and you've just shot yourself in, in the foot, okay? We don't use timeout at meals either, because most of the time the kids are acting out because you brought out a food they can't handle. So if you bring out the liver and onions and they start kicking their brother and you put them in timeout, they're gonna sit in timeout happy as a little clam. And you actually just rewarded them for kicking their brother because they got what they wanted, which was to be away from the table. And the next time you bring out a food they don't like, they're gonna kick their brother again <laughs> to get away from the table. You, you need to think and figure out other ways to deal with that. So here is um, your slide about adrenaline. Okay, so you want to make sure you have a designated place and time and cues that this is now the place and time to eat. Most of us do tons of things at our table. We don't just eat. How does your child know this is now the time and place to eat? So our first recommendation is to fix your child's chair, get them in the 90-90-90 position. The second recommendation is to go out and buy a set of plain, boring plastic placemats that everybody in your family is going to use at every meal time. And we want you to get a new set of placemats now because you will change up your conditioning cue complex. None of us learn to do anything in a vacuum. In your home, if your child is not eating well, all of their conditioning cues are for not eating well. And if you don't change that conditioning cue complex, your child will continue to not eat well. So let me give you an adult example. Let's say I'm a smoker and I want to stop smoking, and my morning routine is I get up first thing in the morning, I have my first cigarette sitting at the kitchen table, drinking coffee out of my favorite mug, reading the paper on my iPad. 
If I want to stop smoking, I cannot go into the kitchen in the morning. I cannot drink coffee. I can't have anything out of my favorite mug. I cannot sit at a table. I can't have my iPad. And I can't have anything to do with the news. Because every one of those cues has become conditioned to the need for nicotine. And if I want to change someone's behavior, I must change the conditioning cue complex in which that behavior occurs. And this may be why your child eats better at school than they do for you at home, or better in a restaurant than they do for you at home. Because your home cues are about not eating. They don't have that conditioning cue complex at grandma's house, or at a restaurant, or at school. If your child eats differently for different people or differently in different environments, you have a conditioning cue complex problem. Change the conditioning cues. A placemat is an easy cue to change and it's portable. Once they get used to eating with it, it becomes a positive cue. You can now take on vacation with you to help your child continue to eat when you're on vacation, when you're at grandma's house, when you're at Disney. Okay, so, so that's how we want you to start thinking. You want to have at least one preferred food at every meal and snack for your child so they have something they like and will eat some volume of it. At least one preferred food, but make sure that you offer other foods as well. So we don't want you to short order cook. We don't want you to serve them a completely different meal than what you're eating. What you need to do is make one big meal and serve all of the foods as one big meal. You may be having spaghetti, meatballs, garlic bread, salad, and chicken nuggets for dinner tonight. Everybody gets some of every one of those foods. We don't expect your child to eat those other foods. What we do expect is that they learn about those foods that they move somewhere up that steps to eating hierarchy with those foods, okay? They need to eat every two and a half to three hours throughout the course of the day. It's a myth that children need to eat only three times a day. This is a study from the World Health Organization about how often children eat. After 12 to 24 months, the average is five, once they stop their last breast or bottle feeding. Between six and 12 months, the average number of times your child eats is 11, 11. So when you feel like all you're doing all day long is feeding your child, you're right. That is all you do, <laughs> especially if they're between six and 12 months. This is the routine we want you to use at meals. Give them a verbal warning. We're going to eat in five minutes. When you go to get them, do not say we're going to eat now. Because if you have a two-year-old, the word you're going to hear is no, <laughs> and now you're power struggling. What you're going to say to them is it's time to wash hands now. You're going to take them to the sink, have them climb up a step stool, and wash their hands. It is a transition activity. Then you're going to sit at the table with a placemat, an empty plate on top of it, and you're going to do family-style serving. Why? You start with their preferred food first. You pick up their chicken nugget. You say, we're having spaghetti and meatballs, garlic bread, salad, chicken nuggets for dinner tonight. I'm going to take a chicken nugget, put it on my plate. Here, Joey, you can. You pass them a dish. You can have a chicken nugget, two chicken nuggets, three chicken nuggets. Put them on your plate. And then pass it to your sister, Susie. And then pass it to daddy. Okay, so they're going to take their preferred food. Let's say you now bring out the noodles, and we're having some noodles, and you know your child's not going to eat it. You're still going to say, I'm going to take some noodles, put them on my plate. Here you go, Joey. You can take some noodles, put it on your plate. You can take one noodle. You can take two noodles. You can take three noodles. They put a noodle on their plate. They pass it to their sister. Where on the steps to eating hierarchy did they just get? Well, if they served it with a fork, they got visual interacts with, smell, if they served it with their fingers, you even got touch. Simply by doing family style serving, you're going to move your child halfway up the steps to eating hierarchy. Let's say you're doing liver and onions, and you say, you can take some liver and onions and put it on your plate, and they're like, no. <laughs> you don't fight with them. 
you're going to say, it's okay if you're not ready for, to learn about it on your plate, you can put it on your placemat. That's why we want you to get plain, boring plastic placemats <laughs> so, so that they're easy to clean. Um, and, and if they really can't handle it on their plate or next to their plate, we're going to introduce a concept called the learning plate. You are going to put a blank empty plate in the middle of the table. You don't talk about it unless you have to. If they really can't handle that liver and onions next to their plate on their placemat, you're going to say, it's OK, don't fight with them. Don't power struggle with them. It's OK if you're not able to learn about it on your placemat. You can put it on the learning plate. They put it on the learning plate. Where on the steps to eating hierarchy did they get with liver and onions? Visual, interacts with, smell. You are still getting that learning. Okay, now it is the learning plate, it is not the ignoring plate. So it means at some point during the meal, you probably should talk about the liver and onions that went on the learning plate and do some teaching. Remember, it's class, you're the professor. Did you know liver and onions has really good iron in it? Um, and it will help make you strong. So something, that is really gray. <laughs> It looks shiny, whatever, <laughs> just make it something positive. And then you need to give a clear, concrete ending to the meal. We are going to do cleanup. You do cleanup somewhere between 20 and 30 minutes after the meal starts. And in cleanup, we want your child to line up one piece of every food served at this meal that they did not actually eat any of in front of them, usually on their placemat, and their job is to either throw or blow it into the trash. If you don't want to bring the trash can to the table, do a scraps bowl, the compost bin. Why do we want them to do that? Because even the liver and onions, we expect them to ideally pick it up and throw it in the trash. So hopefully we get them up to touch. What if they can't take the liver and onions and pick it up and put it in the trash? Give them a fork. It's OK. You can do it with a fork that you at least got more interacts with, right? Maybe it's something not so difficult. They can, are willing to put it on their hand and blow it into the trash. They just got it up by their nose and got a big smell, too, didn't they? If they're willing to blow it, great. Now you got a taste. You'll be amazed at when you give your child permission to spit a food into the trash, how many foods they will taste. Because we socialize our kids early. What goes in the trash stays in the trash. So you want me to put that in my mouth to blow it in the trash? We call it blowing rockets. Sure, I'll do that. Uh, and many times it's the first time kids uh, eat things as well. Uh, if your child gets very visually overwhelmed, you can family style serve in two courses, right? You don't have to serve every single food at this meal uh, right off the bat. Uh, if they start eating during family style serving, let them continue to eat. They can pass with one hand and eat with the other hand. Um, so uh, just think about making sure that um, you, you don't visually overwhelm them. Some kids can only handle three foods at a time. Some kids you can do six foods at a time and they'll be okay. You want to think about making sure the food is in the correct size and shape for your child's oral motor skills. And these are just some ideas of things that you can do. The goal is to make sure the food can be directly placed onto the back molar if possible. So do as many foods in stick shapes as you can. Because if I put a stick shaped food in my mouth, where did that inside bite go? To my back molars. So when I take the bite, it's starting in the right place. What if it's a cheese cube? Put it on a cocktail fork. Put it on this kind of cocktail fork. When I put that cheese cube in my mouth down the side and pull that fork out, that cube is on my back molar, which is where it needs to go for me to chew it and swallow it appropriately. So it's a way to help them compensate. You can pre-chew their meat, take their, their, their steak and chop it up with some crunchy favorite carbohydrate, goldfish crackers. You think that's weird, they don't. 
and actually it would probably be fairly tasty. So if your child really has chewing difficulties, chop it into small pieces, even though you think they're too old for it. Chop it in a chopper with a crunchy carbohydrate. When you chop meat in a chopper with a crunchy carbohydrate, you're forcing the fibers to stay in a particulate form and they will be able to take a pinch of it or a spoonful of it and eat an entire slice or helping of meat simply by making the task easier. If you add a little bit of some mayonnaise into that mixture or the meat is moist enough, you're gonna be able to take a pinch of it, form it into a small ball, put the ball on the end of the cocktail fork and they will get that ball in their mouth and you can get them to eat an entire piece of steak simply by doing that. So think about how you're gonna help make it easier uh, for your child to be able to eat. The rule of thumb is one tablespoon per year of age of each of the th primary nutrition groups. So if I'm three, three tablespoons of chicken nugget, three tablespoons of spaghetti, three tablespoons of salad. So that's just a rough estimate to not overwhelm your child. Now, if you're giving the child for snack, a snack would not be a cookie, a snack would not be an apple. A snack would be part of a cookie, some apple slices, and some peanut butter, perhaps. You're not going to ask your seven-year-old to take seven tablespoons of peanut butter, okay? Um, you will switch to a teaspoon measure for a high-calorie food like that. Let's say the starch in your meal is going to be um, part of a cookie. Do I necessarily want my child to do three tablespoons of cookie? Maybe I'm okay with that. Maybe with that food, I'm gonna to drop to that teaspoon serving and we'll do three teaspoon size pieces of cookie. So that may mean you wanna pre-cut the food <laughs> before you put it out for them. Meals and snacks, 15 to 30 minutes. If you're doing the family style serving, you're gonna kill five minutes. If you're doing cleanup, you're gonna kill five minutes. You only got to keep them up eating for five minutes. Ideally, we'd like to go 20 to 30 minutes. The normal appetite window is 20 minutes. That's, that's the normal appetite window. At 30 minutes, you need to do cleanup. Even if you don't think they've eaten enough, they will learn to speed up and eat more. Because after cleanup time happens, your kitchen is closed. That's it. It's closed. The only thing that comes out of the kitchen in between scheduled meal times is water. That's it. So if your child's grazing, um, you can come talk to me about how we deal with that. We already talked about how you deal with food jags. And then the last series of slides are just some additional red flags um, that if your child has three or more of these red flags, I would strongly encourage you to please try to connect to a feeding therapist um, because your child unfortunately is probably in the problem feeder range. And, and then um, I'm just going to introduce, which I've already done, the sequential oral sensory program. That is the program we use. And um, we have certain tenants. The first is there's myths out, about there about eating. And if you believe those myths, you're not going to understand why your child's not eating and how to help them. We believe in systematic desensitization, a slow, steady approach starting with the easiest thing to do and moving our way towards the hardest thing to do. That's what systematic desensitization is. Um, and I gave you some definitions here, um, but you can read through those. In SOS, we follow normal development. We believe kids have learned to eat in the same way for thousands of years around the world because that's what works best for the body. So that's what we're going to be doing, is following normal development as best as we can. And we're gonna choose the foods we're gonna give your child in a way and prepare them in a way that's gonna help them learn to eat any food on the planet. In our program, our goal is not to teach your child to eat a food. If I spend enough time with your child, I can teach them to eat a hot dog. Why would I wanna do that? I don't wanna build a single brain pathway for eating a hot dog. I wanna build a complex of brain pathways so your child can eat any food on the planet.
So if you want more information about our program, uh, this is where you'll go to. Hopefully after August uh, 1st, you will be able to go there and get all sorts of additional information as a parent about feeding and how to help your child learn to have a lifelong healthy relationship with food because that's our ultimate goal and I know that's your ultimate goal as well. Thank you so much for staying as long as you did and thank you to you guys at home as well.